Hi everybody, this is Robin Switzer. Welcome to KetoCon Online. Hope you've been enjoying all of the presentations this week. I am here this afternoon for a second go around with uh, the angriest trainer in America, uh, Mr. Vinny Tortorich, sometimes um, called the angriest trainer, although I haven't heard that in a long time. Best-selling author, movie producer, podcaster, founder of NSNG, founder of Pure Vitamin Club, Pure Coffee Club. I'm sure there's a lot of stuff in there I've left out, but um, how you doing, Vinny? Well, you, when I hear that coming out of someone's mouth, I, go, I think, wow, it sounds pretty impressive. <laughs> you get Serena in here, so she can hear how impressive I am. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, it's, it's funny you mentioned that we're doing this for a second time uh, because uh, <clears throat> as we've discovered, neither one of us know how to actually work a computer. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's important. I think it's important. You know, people, if I said this to my friends, yeah, I recorded this whole deal and uh, it's for KetoCon and the file got screwed up. It, my agent back when I was in LA would say, screw it, that's it, tell them to move on. Right. But I can't do that, and here's why. That's how important what we're doing is. You know, if, and by the way, I think we're screwing up again. <laughs> I'm pretty sure you don't have this recording working right. If people had seen what we we're trying to do right before you press play, they're gonna figure out that we still don't have it. <laughs> I got a feeling we're going to be doing lap number three. <laughs> God, I hope not. <laughs> so, uh, but Robin, uh, it, it is important. And I want to thank you. Um, you were just telling me you've done 51 recordings. Wow. That's just astronomical. Uh, she's only recorded three people, folks, but it took her 51 <laughs> to get there. Um, no, 51 recordings. And, that, that says something. Uh, so kudos to you and Brian and the whole group. And, and I'll tell you this, you know, when I first met you, you know, I was like, I was like what's, what's this woman's deal, man? What's she doing here? Why, why? I get it, Brian and what he was trying to do. And you left the corporate world to come do this. And that means a lot. Um, Look, I gave up, you, you mentioned Angriest Trainer. I haven't trained anyone in five years, since 2014, uh, six years. And, uh, you know, people go, well, why would you take to the internet where all you do is get beat up all the time? And, and the reason I think is because it's so important. Mm -hmm. You know, what we're doing here is just, is vital to, I, I like to call this somewhat of a movement because you know, we were listening to the government for the past 50 years, and we see what's going on with this whole COVID thing. You know, the, the World Health Organization tells us to do one thing, and we all do it. And then the World Health Organization tells us to do something else. And we all dutifully go, okay, we'll do that. Oh, wait, you want us to stay home forever and lose our jobs? Okay. Uh, you want us to wear masks and, oh, now you don't want us to wear, no, oh, we're, we're wearing, I don't know whether to put the mask on or off. I've been hanging it off of one ear because <laughs> I don't know what the rule is that day. Do I put it on? Is it good to wear the mask? Is it not good to wear the mask? And this is the same group of people who was giving us dietary advice, right? right? We're seeing it in real time right now, but they were all instrumental in coming up with the food pyramid. And look how well that worked out for us. Oh wait, that didn't work out either. You know, it, I, I feel like that food pyramid should be just like the mask that I always have dangling off of one ear. You know, <laughs> like, do I follow it? Do, do I not follow it? Wait, they put dairy and, and then they did my plate. Remember my plate for a while? Oh yeah. And they didn't even put dairy on the plate. Like they gave it like its own children's table at Thanksgiving over here. <laughs> And then they had the plate over here that was just grains and grains and grains. And by the way, some fruit and more grains. None of it ever makes sense. So that, that's why, yeah, you know, I could go on and on and on. And, uh, you know, I don't, ha I, don't, I don't have a political view on it. And I don't care what people think politically, you know, right, left, center. It doesn't matter. What matters is 
when you look around, uh, you and me, we're about the same age. And there were no fat kids when we were young. Right. And now we have, a, you know, we have morbid obesity in kids. Um, a buddy of mine that comes on the podcast, um, 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 oh boy, um, Mexican doctor, Christian, um, help Asad. me. Out. Christian Assad, thank you. He, he was appalled the first time he did a double bypass on a 30 year old. And he, he ran in, it was right after he got to America and started practicing here. He ran in and said to the other cardiologist, you're not gonna believe this. I just gave a 30 year old a double bypass, two stents. And, and they were like, yeah, what, what do you want for lunch? And I was like, no, you, you, maybe you guys didn't hear me. He was 30. And they were like, yeah, yeah, we're gonna grab lunch. What do you want? And he was like, you guys don't seem shocked, but they're like, no, that, that's now the clientele. You know, that's, that's a sad tableau as to what's going on in this country, you know, and, and around the world. And it shouldn't be happening. Um, but anyway, I'm, I'm hogging the conversation. I'm sure you might have a license for something. Uh, I have a long list of questions for you. One of my, I think my first where I really want to start with this is an SNG because I've, I, I've been listening to your podcast for a long time. I, I know your story and I know you had health challenges and I know that you um, incorporated a low carb, high fat diet into your lifestyle many years ago and you were using it when you were training uh, celebrities as well. Yeah. And I've often thought about how things would be so different today if the news had if the word had gotten out sooner, if things didn't, if, if things didn't happen the way that they did, uh, we'd be in a much better place right now. And I'm sure that must have been really frustrating for you because you, you saw what was going on years ago when the fads were to eat lots of carbs. Um, and I, did you use that when you were training, when you were younger? Yeah. Um, God, I remember going all the way back to I want to say 1984, um, I was kind of using what I was calling the Atkins approach with my training because people wanted to know what to eat. And I would just say, you know, go read Atkins book. And then nobody wanted to go read a book. So I just started incorporating that and, and suggesting eat more meat and it would go, but you know, I don't want to drop dead of a heart attack. And the reason I bring up 1984 was uh, a bunch of uh, really wealthy clients, well, all my clients were wealthy, but, you know, back then, that was the only people that can afford trainers. And there was only four of us in the country. And, and um, I was in Aspen, Colorado that summer, training some people. And the, it might have been 85, but I want to say it was 84. Um, this book was going around, like everyone was reading a book by a guy named Dr. Robert Haas called Eat to Win. Mm -hmm. and eat to win, eat to win. And I, I started reading this book. And even though the onion wasn't around back then, if the onion was around, I thought, it, I, I, I looked at the front, I wanted to make sure this wasn't put out by Mad Magazine. And I wasn't kidding. I, I started reading this book. And this guy was saying exactly the opposite thing of anything. It flew in the face of everything that I believed in in 1984. You know, I didn't say zero carbs. You know, now I'm in SNG, no sugars, no grains. Back then, it was just, you got to lower your carbs. And, and by the way, it, now there's more seed oils and everything we put in right. every product. And you got to remember, back in 84, people were still eating real whole foods. They weren't eating stuff from packages the way we do today. Um, we didn't look at 7-Eleven as a nutritional deli the way we do now. But this guy was saying some pretty outlandish stuff. Um, eat mounds of pasta, because if you don't eat fat, pasta has no fat. If you don't eat fat, you can't get fat. Um, his other statement in the book, and, and this one still burns in my memory, and it will never go away. He said, fat burns in a flame of carbohydrates. So the more carbohydrates you eat, the more fat you will burn. Mm -hmm. And I'm I, I literally kept looking. It's like, this has got to be a joke. This can't be real. Uh, before you go out and play a couple of rounds of tennis, drink 32 ounces of orange juice 
and you know just all this crazy stuff and i'm like wow well wh what what are we doing the reason i mentioned the aspen part of this by the time i got to aspen the following summer to go work with those same people every restaurant there um because it was the only time i got to eat out i was a poor kid right out of college but every time i went to eat out it was pasta on top of pasta and you know i grew up in an italian household and it was a meat dish it was either some you know cheap piece of meat because we weren't very wealthy or fish we were in louisiana so there's a lot of fish or chicken that was the major portion of what we ate and then on the side there was some pasta right so when we had spaghetti and meatballs the meatballs were like <laughs> And then there was some pasta underneath, right? Now, all of a sudden, meat didn't come on the dish. If you went to an Aspen, there was a place called Metzaluna. Um, it was more famous than one in California is where OJ's wife had her last meal before some mysterious person killed her. We're still looking for that killer. Folks, if you have any information on that, let us know. Um, but uh, we would go to Metzaluna every night. And they would go, would you like the angel hair pasta? Sure. What does that come with? Well, we sprinkle a little olive oil on it, you know, or we, you know, we, you could get it in a, a clam sauce. Who does that come with clams? No, it's clam sauce. <laughs> we want you to be healthy. Um, uh, pasta puttanesca was another big dish. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but pasta puttanesca doesn't have any meat in it. It's just stewed tomatoes poured over pasta. Uh, Puta in Italian means a uh, uh, whore. It's the whore's pasta. It's, it's made to be cheap so that any whore in between doing her job can have a bite to eat and get right. That's what I mean, Puta Nasty. Every time I hear that in restaurants, I go, am I the only one that gets the joke? I grew up in one of those Italian households. And I'm like, do they all get what they're saying right now? We have horror pasta as a special. But the dishes were bigger and bigger. They, they were just giant. And I looked at that and went, what's going on here? And all of my clients that year later were still saying what Dr. Robert Haas wrote in that book, Eat to Win. Well, you know, the more pasta you eat, the more weight you lose. You know, you, you lose your know, fat burns and flame of carbohydrates. And I'm like, wow, this is taking off. This is a year later and they're still right. doing it. Um, so yeah, I, I had a tough road to hoe, uh, just trying to get these people to, to do the right thing, you know? And, and, and um, I was always fighting an uphill battle. Um, it got easier though, when I got to Hollywood, because Hollywood doesn't care how the sausage is packed. You know, um, the one thing people have to understand about actors and actresses, these people have type A plus personalities. If they have to lose 40, 50 pounds for a movie and they're already at an average weight, but they, let's say an actress has to look like she has cancer in the movie, I would get hired to do that. Um, you know, uh, Tom Hanks had to have some kind of trainer when he played the AIDS patient in that movie, Philadelphia. It wasn't me, by the way, but some, <laughs> you know, he worked with someone to get that way, right? So if, if a Vinny comes in and says, you have to eat, zero sugar, zero carbs, zero pizzas, you know, no ice cream. They're so A plus personality, they don't, it's like the devil may care. So they, they're gonna listen to you more than the people in Aspen or New Orleans or wherever else I, I train people. So I, that's a long story, but that's the answer, I think. So you, what made you coin the phrase and, or the, the acronym NSNG? Fear. It was absolutely fear-based. Um, you know, a lot of people know the story, but I think it's worth telling. Um, when I, I wrote Fitness Confidential, the, the book that kind of made all this happen for me, uh, I, I, if you Googled my name, I didn't show up anywhere in Google. Um, you could get Vinny Paz, you could get um, um, Vinny, um, Vinny Jones, you know, there were famous Vinnies out there. Vinny Tortoris did not show up in a Google search. And 
you know, an agent over at William Morris said, we know who you are because you've been training our clients for years, but you're not on the internet. And I went, uh, yeah, that's a good thing, right? I mean, <laughs> who wants to be in, in the middle of that crap? And he goes, no, you don't understand. You won't sell one book unless you find a way to get on that internet. And so I, I started a podcast. Between hearing that, within a week, I, was, I had started a podcast. Um, and um, we were doing that. But you got to remember, this was like, you know, I wrote the book nine years ago. Right. Book has been out for eight years, almost 10 years ago, I wrote the book. I was scared to use the word ketogenic. Mm -hmm. Think about that. Um, and my the guy I wrote the book with, Dean Laurie, he kept saying, but you're talking about ketogenic diets. And I said, yes. But as soon as you write the word ketogenic, the problem becomes ketoacidosis. Right. They both start with the word keto. They mean completely two different things, but everyone's going to go, oh, ketoacidosis is going to kill you. And by the way, I still hear that today. Yeah. You know, th that hasn't gone away. So I was actually correct about that. And he goes, well, why don't you call it low carbohydrate? I said, that's too many. That's too much. It's, you know, people are going to go low. What? What are you talking about? Carbohydrates? I don't really, people don't know. What the, the average person doesn't know what the macronutrients are and, and sure. they don't care. And he said at the essence, because Dean was a client of mine. Uh, he was also a famous TV, still is a famous TV writer and, and producer. And uh, he said, well, how about you just tell them what not to do. And I said, no sugars, no grains. And we decided that was perfect. I wrote down no sugars, no grains. And then once that took off, NSNG became a thing. And I, I had to go and register it and, and trademark it and do all mm -hmm. that stuff because it was mine. Um, but that's how it got started. I w it was fear. It was absolute unadulterated fear that if I used the word ketogenic, I would be considered a bigger kook than I was considered by telling people <laughs> not to eat bread. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So it started with NSNG, a podcast. And now how many podcasts do you do? You do five podcasts a week now? Yeah. Um, it, right from the beginning, we did three. Uh, it was me and Anna Vocino. Uh, by the way, I, Anna Vocino was going to come to KetoCon, as you know, um, and cook because th that career has taken off for her. Um, it was me and Anna Vocino. We did three shows a week. We did them all on a Sunday. So we would sit there on a Sunday while our families were out doing everything. And we would pop out. It would take us about four, four and a half hours to get to three. And then, of course, you have to go and do all kinds of stuff to them. And right. uh, it was it was kind of a a full-time job from the beginning. Now we do five a week. We went to four a week and then five a week. Anna still does the Monday show with me. And um, it's become a full-time job. And, and that's, people say, what do you do for a living? I, I'm a podcaster. Mm -hmm. And you know, a lot of times they go, oh, that's quaint. You're in your basement. That's good. <laughs> How are you making a living? <laughs> very, very slowly. I can tell you. <laughs> you know, podcasting, um, and, and by the way, I have a successful podcast. Um, very successful and it's hard to make a living if sure. that's all you're doing um because the, the number of people i have working behind the scenes eats up that podcast income right um and so but but i'm i'm very lucky you know we have pure vitamin club a company i started um that's gangbusters and pure coffee club that does very well and just recently we were gonna crank it open we're still not saying what it is robin but you know what right. it is NSNG Foods is happening this summer, um, and we're coming up with our first products. Um, I, I was having a meeting about that right before we got onto this this conference. Well, that's exciting. Yeah, thanks. So it, I, uh, I won't I won't pester you about what the products are. I, um, you, well, you know what the products are. <laughs> We had a conversation. We were going to break it at, at KetoCon. At KetoCon, yeah. 
Yeah, well, and, uh, Anna and I actually already recorded last week, and she did a cooking demo on her recording. So um, the people who are watching this would have had access to Anna's recording a day or two earlier than this one. And she did a great job. She's very funny. Very yeah, funny. Well, people don't realize Anna's super talented. She wrote both of those cookbooks, Eat Happy and Eat Happy Too, herself. and. Um, she she couldn't afford a, a photographer because it would have been like 30 40 grand you know food sure. photography is not cheap so she learned how to do food photography and she did uh, those books are all her they're and, awesome uh, too. They're beautiful books yeah they're incredible and uh, she's coming up with some new products too so this podcast has allowed all of us to to kind of spread our wings and and, and you know and, and it's funny you know early on people were coming to me out of the woodworks when the podcast got popular and they were like, well, you know, you can monetize this and you can monetize that. And you can get these people, you know, you could, you know, tell them that, you know, it's free, but then when they come in, you got, you know, click funnels and you get, and I said, no, no, no. I didn't get into this to, to trick people into paying me. <laughs> you know, I'll keep doing all of this for free. And hopefully some of them will go out and buy my coffee or my vitamins and then I can feed myself and my family. And that's the way it's worked out, you know, so we've sure. been very lucky. Well, I think that Pure Vitamin Club, um, you know, when you look at the website and the description of the company mission, it's pretty obvious what you're trying to do and um, which is not provide a supplement without any fillers, without any additives. Uh, but can you talk a little bit about the coffee? I don't know very much about the coffee. Well, I could tell you about the coffee by telling you about the vitamins um, okay. because they, they followed each other. Um, pure, you know, I, I had leukemia back in 07. I, I chronicle it in my book, Fitness Confidential. And um, I think that's why the book got so popular because it got in the cancer community. People are looking for hope. Yes. And, by every stretch of the imagination, I shouldn't be here talking to you today, uh, but but I made it, and uh, and that book gives hope to a lot of people. And um, I don't know if you've ever read Fitness Confidential, but there's all these crazy stories of my life in there, mm -hmm. and the fitness industry, and how weird all of that is. And you know, I walked into a gym when I was eight years old. And I've literally I've never walked out, um, but. After cancer, um, I, I, I started questioning everything I put in my body, and I've always been a vitamin taker. And I started noticing things like titanium dioxide, and, um, and it's like, well, why would, why would this even be in a vitamin? And, you know, the reason I found out is they like to whitewash the vitamin and then put a color in it that they think people might like. Mm -hmm. So they add titanium dioxide. So then I went down the rabbit hole of titanium dioxide to learn that even in nanoparticles, it causes colon cancer. So the one thing you put in your body to make you better can actually kill you. Uh, the other thing I found was magnesium stearate, which is not the same as magnesium. The stearate form blocks the absorption of other nutrients. That's why if you take a vitamin, you'll see the this your pee will turn a light bright fluorescent because all of those incredible vitamins you took just sliced out right so i was like i wonder if i can make a vitamin that's completely pure you know mm -hmm. that's the best vitamins in the world and and that was the mission statement and we pulled it off um when i got the pure coffee club it was the same thing um it, you know, coffee is coffee, right? Um, you can buy better beans, you know, Arabica beans from around the world, depending on when they're uh, available and the whole thing. But because I'm such a coffee freak, and I have been, because coffee is one of the healthiest things next to just plain water. Look, I, I have a coffee sitting right here. Um, you know, two things, water and coffee, the two healthiest liquids in the world. And I started looking around going, okay, how is it that Starbucks, you know, I was in Starbucks one day and they had, a, a, it was called Verona blend. Mm -hmm. And 
you know, I noticed that we had Verona blend in the house year round. And I started asking myself a question, wait, how can this Verona be here year round? Because different, you know, coffee follows the equator. It's grown right around the, the, the center, the middle of the earth, you know, right around the equator. So Ethiopia will have it for a while. Costa Rica will have it for a while. Parts of Hawaii will have it. And we have it around the world like that. But how much coffee does a company, you know, the, the second biggest fast food restaurant in the world, Starbucks, how is it they can have house blend year round and Verona year round and this? How can they have all of these year round? because these countries don't have those beans year round. So after digging and digging and digging, I found out, wait a minute, they're not using the same beans. What they're doing is they're finding beans from around the world and they're concocting what tastes like the same flavor, right? So you could do that with blends, you can mess with, you, so you have some really substandard beans that you can mix with this and you mix it. And so they're really bastardizing their coffee. That's why Starbucks coffee doesn't taste that good. You know, they're always, it's like, it tastes like something burnt to me, you know? And being somewhat of a connoisseur, you know, I would buy other people's coffee. Uh, Blue Bottle was making, you know, it's called third wave coffee, you know, people making the good stuff. Blue Bottle was doing a good job. Intelligentsia was doing a good job for a long time. Black Rifle was doing a good job for a long time. And, and all these different, you know, third wave small companies were doing such a good job that I wanted to learn more about roasting. And I, I got into roasting and doing my own stuff. And when people would come over, they would go, oh my God, this is amazing and where did you get this from and i was finding green beans from everywhere and roasting them on my front porch oh wow because coffee roasting makes a lot of smoke and um serena almost killed me i tried roasting it in the house every alarm went off and yeah so i just got more and more into roasting and getting into the roast and holding and you know when people come to your house and say they like your coffee that's one thing when they say, look, I'll pay you anything if you can make me some of that so that I can have some at my house. And it's like, well, yeah, I don't think you understand. It wouldn't be cost effective. But I went down that same road. You know, I started buying beans from around the world. I would have to go to these different countries and find the beans, make deals with the farmers. Mm -hmm. And I learned a lot. You know, guess what? As it turns out, Starbucks is not buying the best Arabica beans. They're buying the second level, in some cases, the third tier level. They're buying crappy beans. That's why it tastes the way it does. By and large, truck stops now have better coffee than Starbucks. Right. You know, you know um, I think someone told me Dunkin' Donuts has a great coffee now. It's not hard to beat Starbucks, right? Mm -hmm. But to get into that third wave for the connoisseurs, that, that's what we did. And, and it, it, it's a profitable company. It does well. And... I'm very proud of it because, <laughs> you know, it, you know, I'm in the coffee, you know, I'm a coffee guy now, you know, it's like, I've always wanted to be that guy. Right. So it works out. So is there a vineyard, in your, a wine vineyard in your future? <laughs> <laughs> Would you believe that we thought we talked about that? Really? Um, we talked about that and we talked about pure scotch because people know that I like, I like flavors and, and what have you. And um, it would be tough to get into the scotch business, uh, you know, in this country. And, and you know, how, how do you beat what they're doing over in Scotland anyway? I mean, you, you're not gonna beat some of these Eve's layers and the whole thing. And then, you know, I actually talked to friends of mine in the wine business to see if we could do a, a dry, I know there's dry farm wines and all this kind of mm -hmm. stuff. They're doing a lower carb wine. And I think they're doing an excellent job. They are. Um, and their wines taste good. They really do. Mm -hmm. um, but I would want more flavor than that. I, I would want it to taste more like a wine that I, I don't drink wine because of the amount of sugar in it. Mm -hmm. And I've enjoyed some dry form wines um, from, from their, their deal. I don't know if it's possible to make it 
you know, for people who don't like dry wines. I'm not sure how that works because I don't particularly like dry wines. I, I mm -hmm. like the fruitier right. stuff. So I just tend to stay away from it than drinking it at all. Um, and if I could figure that out, I, I would start the company tomorrow, <laughs> Pure Wines. But uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I don't know how to make that work, you know. I, but it's crossed our minds. We, we've gone down that road a bit. It sure seems like that would be a, a, a good spot for you. You have connections in Italy, don't you? I do. Um, I, I have some connections in California. You know, I was talking to some friends in California and that would just be a, a just, just tough, it would be a very tough road to hope. So instead of, instead of opening a vineyard, you decided to do something easy, like produce a movie. Yes, I did. <laughs> Would you believe let's talk about another movie? <laughs> <laughs> I would. I'm glad to hear that. Um, yeah, you know, people are, you know, <laughs> God, well, I'm not a movie producer. I'm not, I'm not a Hollywood guy. I'm, I'm a simple guy that grew up in a swamp in Louisiana, right? <laughs> um, the next thing I know, I have a movie that's killing it. And and I'm not sure how that works, right? We sat down, look, without Peter Pardini, none of this would have been, the, the kid is a genius. Uh, unfortunately, if I do another movie, it won't involve him because his career, you know, he, he's not a documentarian. He, he's a guy who followed me, you know, he's a movie maker mm -hmm. and he's got other projects and he works on actual movies. and. He lost a lot of weight following in S and G, and he had a passion for doing this. Sure, but th there's not a whole lot of money in documentaries, <laughs> and you know he can't keep doing documentaries. He's got to move on to bigger movies. So, you know, the next movie won't involve Pardini, w which is sad. Um, but there's talk. There's real talk going on. Uh, Good. I don't know if I can ever pull it off again. Though. I, I, yeah, I think you can. Peter, One of the highlights of, I'm sorry? Peter was such a big part of it. I, you know, I, I would be on my own. So you, we would see what I can do this time. <laughs> well, I have to tell you that, I mean, not only for myself, but I would say including for myself, the the highlight or one of the highlights of KetoCon 2019 was you sharing a clip of, the fat documentary uh, on stage when you were speaking. So um, I know that there was a lot of excitement around that. A lot. <laughs> the fact yeah. that you were even there was exciting, but then you got on stage and showed everybody a clip of the movie that was very exciting for everybody. You know, it, it, the funny thing is, Robin, is you know, I walk on stage, well, over the past three months, I haven't walked on one stage anywhere. <laughs> Last time I spoke anywhere was at Low Carb Houston. And, you know, I, I took some time off because I was moving to Virginia. And then the whole world shut down and all of my, my speeches were canceled. Um, but, you know, I walk on stage all the time and, and just do, do my song, and my, my dog and pony, as I call it. And... Um, Going up in KetoCon and putting that movie up there was scary as hell for me. Really? Because for the first time, you know, it was only 17 minutes. We, we cut it down. We, we showed a 17-minute clip before the movie came out. And you always hear these actors talking about bearing their soul. Well, I had been living with this thing for a year, and now an audience was going to see it. Sure. You don't know if they're going to laugh, boo cry, hiss, you, you just, uh, and, and I went, okay, here it is. Here's, here's the movie to, there had to be 700, 800 people or more in, in that audience, right? And yeah, that seating area holds about a thousand people and there was nowhere to sit and the aisles on both sides of the keynote staging area were full. So I would say there's probably 1200 people it was, it was crazy, and I was like, oh, God, I hope I don't let these, because a lot of these people, a lot of these people had invested in the movie. We did, you know, we did a, 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 a GoFundMe, I don't know right. what it was called, 
Um, but yeah, I'm like, God, this is their money and they're gonna see what I did with their money and I hope they don't <laughs> hate me. And, uh, and when, when it was over and people were laughing at the appropriate points and I showed the part with the foot being chopped off and people were appalled. And, and, and then when people applauded at the end, I was like, oh, oh, thank God, thank God. <laughs> because it, it really gets scary, you know, because you don't know what people are gonna do. And I knew I had to walk back on that stage and take a few questions at the end. And I was like, God, I hope they don't start going, who do you think you are? And why did you do it? <laughs> it was weird for me. Well, it was, it was completely the opposite of that. I mean, I think that I remember standing probably a good 15 minutes waiting to talk to you after you got off stage because people were just um, very eager to talk to you. And I didn't hear any negative, so. It was very well received. Well, it was, and thank you for for even hosting me and allowing me to do that. Um, and when the movie came out, it it, it really did gangbusters. And and um, I was looking at the last quarter, and the movie it, it it somehow in the third quarter usually things drop off. Mm -hmm. It it didn't drop off. It's keeping the steam. It's 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 moving. And that's why everyone's talking to me about, wait, you have a documentary that people are watching. Right. And you do another documentary. And I'm going, I'm, I'm making coffee and <laughs> I'm, I'm roasting beans and I'm, I'm, I'm finding a company. But here I am talking about doing another one now. You know, so we, you know, I, someone's going to have to come up with money. Um, and I don't feel like I could go back. Oh, I almost knocked my light over. I, I don't think I could go back to people again and and say, hey, give me more money to do another movie. So um, um, I think you have I think you have a, a very wide audience. Um, I mean, the ketogenic diet and lifestyle, low carb, um, that 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 movement continues to spread, especially I mean, even right now. Um, when people are talking about the importance of building up your immune system, uh, I see I see it I see more and more everywhere related to low carb, no sugars, um, related to the ketogenic diet. And as you know, I mean, we get contacted by product manufacturers all the time that want to get into this space because they see money in it. Um, and that's a whole other topic of conversation, but. Um, uh, I I don't think that you would have any problem. I, I mean, I know for myself personally, and I, I would always back work that you do. I I'm going to see if there's a way where I can do it. Um, you know, I, I put a lot of my own money behind this movie. Right. Um, and I didn't think I would ever get it back. I got it back. And I, I got more than getting it back. I made a few bucks. Um, so any money I made on the last movie will be thrown into the next one. Mm -hmm. um, I'll see if I can get some, some private backers to cover the rest of it. Uh, if I can't, then I might go to the group and, and you know, group meaning the keto community and go, look, guys, I don't think I need the quarter of a million dollars I needed last time, um, but I might need, who knows, 20, 30, 40, 50, 50 I, I don't know what I might need. And go, look guys, you know, you saw what we did last time. I don't need quite as much money. I just need to finish this. You know, just the lawyer fees, you know, to get, you know, I don't think people realize, I mean, you have to have lawyers, you have to have, you know, you have to get stuff cleared, just on and on and on. And there's no way of doing this stuff cheap, but I, I have an idea that, I, and I think, I think the next movie if, if I can pull it off, can possibly trump the movie we just did. Wow. So um, we, you know, let's see. I, you know, I, I could be completely wrong about this. Um, the one thing I can tell you is I didn't sit around during COVID-19. I, I kept busy figuring out how to make this happen. So we'll see. Okay. Well, um, I think we have about 10 more minutes and we had several people sending questions for you. So if you don't mind, I'll ask you a few of those questions before we break. Absolutely. 
Okay, the first question was, do you feel it is necessary to carb cycle in order to see muscle gain when you're following a ketogenic diet? Absolutely not. Um, that's an excuse to go eat ice cream. Um, the, the, the carb cycling, you know, it, it comes from the bodybuilding world where these guys, they carb up, you know, just to, you know, because they, they think they're going to have better workouts and the whole thing, and they do. But, you know, you're not, you, you can't outrun a bad diet. When you're eating carbs, it's not like you're burning off those carbs and nothing else happens. Right. right? Um, you, when you take in those carbs to carb cycle, you're, you're causing damage to your liver. You know, you're, 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 you're starting fatty liver disease. You're, you're creating problems. There is no reason to do any of this. And you're not, once you're fully fat adapted and you're living on ketones, there, there is no reason to do anything else. Robin, I just did, I'm 57 years old. I did an hour and 10 minutes with my weights this morning with intensity that you wouldn't believe. And then I got on my spinner and rode for an hour and five minutes. I would have ridden for an hour, but I was watching an old George Carlin <laughs> for an hour and five minutes. And, um, and I did that. And by the way, that I finished maybe two hours ago. I haven't eaten yet. You know, you know that, that's the difference. Yeah, if, if you're carb dependent at any rate, you would be on the couch next to me in a coma right now by doing that much exercise and you know burning through that much glycogen you know going through your glucose but here i am i, I seem wide awake to you right of course <laughs> you know it's like i'm wide awake and you know it's um for, for your audience it's, it's what uh 3 30 i don't have my glasses on um i won't eat until six or seven this evening you know it's <laughs> So that, that's the answer to that. You know, it's not needed. You're looking at proof right in front of you. And go on the internet. Go find Dr. Sean Baker. Go find uh, uh, Dr. Ken Berry. Go find any of these guys. They'll tell you the same thing. And look at them. These guys are built like, like sentinels, man. They're, they're, these, these men are built like animals. <laughs> Very true. Okay. Um, let's see. The next question is, which you kind of already answered, do you follow an, uh, an intermittent fasting schedule? Not really. Um, well, today I'm on one because, right. <laughs> because I, have, I, I did podcasts before this. I'm doing this and I'm doing more podcasts. Um, but no, generally I don't. Uh, I had a big breakfast this morning, including, I, I want to say I had, I had three eggs with an extra yolk and I had two or three slices of bacon. Uh, one of my cups of coffee had a little cream in it, um, but not enough to really get the color uh, anywhere, anywhere past, um, you know, like a dark brown color. You know, it wasn't even khaki. It was dark brown. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that, that's all the calories I've taken in today. And um, I'm perfectly fine. Uh, would I have liked to have had lunch? Yes. Um, but I'm busy today, so it just didn't happen, and I'm not hurting for it. Okay. Uh, this one is, uh, is uh, I didn't write it, but I, I like the question. Uh, as people get older, how can they avoid muscle loss? Uh, lifting heavy things, b b your bottom line. Um, you know, let's go back to Sean Baker. I, I, I'm 57. I think he's 54. Uh -huh. And the guy keeps muscle on uh, to the point where people think he's he's juicing and taking steroids or whatever. Yeah. I know Sean. I, I can tell you, uh, I, I, uh, there's no reason to think he. You know, look at my friend Dr. Drew. Um, I went to his 60th birthday, so he's older than me. So Drew is probably 61 now. The guy, you know, keeps muscle on. But I've seen, you know, Drew's got a gym in his house. He's got a rack. He squats. He does deadlifts. Lifting heavy things, you know, we start losing a pound of muscle every year. Males do, but females a little less than that. Every year, starting around your 30th, 34th, 35th birthday, um, until you die, unless you do something about it. You know, 
And the only thing you can do about it, that you know, it's the fountain of youth is to move weight. So I always say, don't think of exercise as a weight loss proposition. Think of it as the fountain of youth. You know, you, you control your weight in the kitchen. Uh, you control everything else in the gym. Very good. The last question, and this is the, the most fun one. Uh, how did you meet Serena? <laughs> at the aforementioned Starbucks. <laughs> um, we met at, at, a, at, we met twice at the same Starbucks. Um, you know, when, when I, when I told, I used to tell that story a few years ago, or she would tell it, people were like, is that code for you guys met on a dating site? <laughs> think about that. Bond girls don't go onto dating sites. Yeah, I think you know? we're past the generation of using dating. Oh, I, you know what? That's probably a stupid thing to say because I'm not, um, I'm married, but I would assume that people in our age group, did, how, old, how long have you known Serena? We met in right, well, here's the thing. We, we met twice, as I said, at the same Starbucks. We met for the first time probably in late 2006 or early 2007. Okay. Yeah. I don't even know if there were dating sites then. There probably were, and I just didn't know about it. <laughs> I, there were, because I tried one for like, <laughs> I, they gave the free trial, and um, a buddy of mine convinced me to go on to it because, um, <laughs> Uh, you know, I kept, you know, in Hollywood, you meet a lot of vapid people. Right. And um, it's like, well, look, if you go in these dating, I think they were much more, um, uh, it was a simpler time. <laughs> where people say, oh, no, you, you can cut through all the minutia of the first date. You can read about these people. What they didn't tell you is what these people, are, you know, I wrote nothing but honesty on my site. Turns out I was the only one. <laughs> Yeah, I would show up and some of the women would go, oh, wait, you actually look like your photo. And I would look at them and go, I didn't even recognize you from your photo. So that's a lie. You know, and, you know, then you find out that they're not the CEO of, um, you know, Disney. And, uh, you know, that they're actually trying to get a job sweeping up at Disney. Um, you met a real Bond girl in a Starbucks. I did and didn't even know who she was because I have a no actress policy uh, and anyone that lives in Hollywood has a no actress policy. And if, if you want to hear the story, I'll tell it to you. Um, sure, if you have time I got, to tell it. I got a few minutes. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> we, we, we met, you know, I was going on a bike ride and I was meeting my friend at the Starbucks and right when we took off, these two women were finishing up their run and my friend stopped to say hi to these two women. And Serena was one of those women. Uh, but she had on the big, thick Oakley glasses and the cap pulled down on her face and all thing. But I could tell, you can't hide that much cute. No. Uh, she, this woman is stunning. And I went, eh, she's kind of cute. And I, I noticed, you know, she didn't have a ring on, which doesn't mean anything. You go for a run, you might take a look <laughs> off. So I asked my friend, I said, hey, the cute one over there, is she married her? She goes, no, but I think she dates someone, you know? She goes, because my friend knew the other woman that Serena was running with. And I said, oh, okay. Well, turns out she was dating someone and I went off and had cancer. Oh. So I learned about cancer right after that. So almost a whole year passed, I was at the same Starbucks with a different friend Serena and uh, the same woman, by the way, <laughs> was having coffee. They had just dropped their kids off at school. And uh, my, my other friend knew these two women because all their kids went to school together. So they invited us to sit down for a second. And uh, the other woman knew about me because apparently I had trained her neighbor. Okay. <laughs> it was that kind of thing. And uh, I started talking and I went, oh, you running running you guys were running about a year ago and she, yeah how do you remember i said because i asked about you and you know someone said you were you were dating someone and she said yep i'm still dating someone but she gave me her business card okay <laughs> yeah, which didn't say bond girl on it it was just <laughs> a card it said serena scott thomas and uh 
So I called, uh, you know, I didn't learn that she was an actress until we, right before we went on our first date, because I wouldn't have ever asked her out. Um, but I'm glad I didn't know that. And I'm glad I didn't have that preconceived notion of her because uh, as it turns out, you've met Serena. She's, um, she's exactly the way she, you know, you would think she would be. It's just a wonderful person. And uh, she really is. Yeah, lucky to have her in my life. But yeah, we met at a Starbucks. <laughs> <laughs> well, Vinny, um, I, I, I am incredibly um, honored and appreciative for everything that you've done for not only for KetoCon, which you've been incredibly supportive, but also to support this low carb ketogenic movement because with, with your, even though you're humble about it, celebrity, you have a very wide reach and you impacted a lot of people. And even if you haven't spoken to them directly, they've spoken to other people that you've impacted. So on behalf of all of those people and from the KetoCon audience, thank you for everything that you're doing. Thank you for being willing to record this twice. And um, thank you for having me on your podcast. And thank you for participating in KetoCon. Well, uh, you know, I, I'm gonna say this while you still have the, the tape rolling. Um, <laughs> hopefully next year when we're all uh, back to reality and we're all, you know, congregating again. Yeah, again. Uh, I'm, hope, I'm hoping that you will invite me back to KetoCon because uh, <laughs> I wouldn't miss it for the world. Um, please, begging you, please invite me again. And, <laughs> And I will see you for the third recording because I'm pretty sure this one didn't record either. <laughs> if it didn't, we're going to find a way to make it work anyway. <laughs> All right, All right. Thank you very much. Thank you.